Hey, this is Jason, just doing a derivation of a couple of results for the Cosmic Microwave Background that I promised in the Cosmic Microwave Background video. So we're going to go over this real quick. Uh, there's two problems. They come from the textbook. And in the textbook, which I'm paging through now, they are problems, numbers, whatever numbers are the problems here. They would be exercises number 22.5 and 2.6 in the textbook. So if you turn in your hymnals to those, we'll go over them shortly. First, let's do a brief review of the exact setup of the problem. Uh, we're looking at the energy density of the black body radiation. That's what that E of F df times F cubed df over that exponential of HF kT of minus one is. And the number density is N as a function of frequency df. And so these are differential equations with those little dfs, meaning we're going to be using integral calculus in order to get our answer. To get the number density, we take the energy density divided by the frequency of one one photon, and that uh, gets rid of one factor of f in the numerator and uh, puts a factor of h in the denominator, getting rid of it from the energy set. So again, lambda is wavelength, that's equal to c divided by f, which is frequency, and photons do have an energy e sub gamma, which is equal to h, the Planck's constants, times the frequency. And all of these things are measured in differentials, which is a small range of frequencies between f plus a tiny range df. Now we're going to do a substitution of variables. We're not going to use the frequency in our differential equation anymore. We're going to use a new variable called x, and x will be defined to be h is the Planck's constant times the frequency divided by kT. So we're basically kind of using what's x in the exponential and turning that into our variable. Now to do that, we've got to replace uh, f wherever we see it with hf over kt. If we don't have an hf over kt in there, we've got to put it an h over kt. We've got to put that in there. So notice in the numerator, we've got an f squared df. So each of those, in order to turn into an x, we've got to add in a factor of h over kt. So that's why in the next line, is we have n of x dx, which is our new variable, we've added as a coefficient kt over h cubed as a coefficient to the, to the expression. Now we've replaced the f and hf over kt with that capital letter x, but then that's where we have to have that kt cubed or h cubed in there. Now, second, we've already from previous examples, if we integrate over all frequencies from zero to infinity, we get n sub gamma, which is equal to some number 2.4041 divided by pi squared h bar cubed c cubed times kt cubed. And that's the energy, well not energy, that's the number density of photons in a black body spectrum. So for a given temperature. So now we're going to use that. Okay, so the next thing we have looks pretty hairy, but it's actually not if you take a close examination. The numerator is n of x dx, which is that big expression we see there, and the denominator is n sub gamma, which we just got from before. Notice that uh, in, we, so we, that's what's in the big parentheses on top and the little parentheses on bottom. Notice what we can do is kind of interesting. We, can, we see that there's a kt cubed in both the numerator and denominator, so both of those can be canceled. And now here's something fascinating. You got a c cubed, right, which is speed of light cubed. That's also in the numerator and denominator, and that can be canceled. Now we've got an 8 pi over h, over h cubed on the numerator, but a 1 over pi squared 1 over h bar cubed in the denominator of the denominator. It's kind of a weird way of saying it. But if we actually look at it, h bar is actually 2 pi, is 2 pi h. So if we look closely, we see that 8 pi over c cubed, 8 pi over h cubed is the same as 1 over pi squared h bar cubed. So those all cancel, and we're really just left with 1 over 2.4041, which is that uh, constant of integration from the number density uh, of the black body spectrum, which is great. We get rid of all those constants, and everything. We don't have to worry about them later. That's really good. So I'm just going to redefine uh, the capital letter K as the reciprocal of 2.4041 for later use. Now we look at the two problems in particular. One of them first posits that we look at the long wavelength regime. This is problem 2.6. And the long wavelength regime, we're going to look at the number density of photons for 
all photons from some uh, range that is h of f, which is going to be less than some energy, e sub naught, which is going to be less than itself, kt. So we're going to look at some uh, all the photons from zero up through e naught, and e naught itself will be less than kt as an energy. Therefore, that x is then small because x is the ratio of hf to kt, so hf divided by kt will be a small number in general for all x. All right, so let's look at that ratio again. n of h of f less than e naught over k minus kt is now an integral, and this is we're taking getting rid of the differential form, and we're integrating across a bunch of basically frequencies where it's now re-represented re by this variable x. And of course, we're dividing by the n gamma. So this equation then is k, which is a constant, and we're then multiplying that constant times an integral from zero to e naught over kt. And again, our variable integration is now x, not frequency. And e naught over kt is representative of frequency, representative of a ratio of energies, basically. But we, now we have this expression where we're going to have to integrate. However, in the small version of x, where x is small, the exponential of a small number is 1 plus that small number. That's the, uh, that is the small number approximation for a, the, the uh, exponential function. And so notice that we've changed the exp of x to 1 plus x. So 1 plus x minus 1 is simply x, and x squared divided by x is, well, x. And so that's what you get in the final equation is the integral of 0 to kt of x dx, and that's very simple. That's basically just 1 half times x squared evaluated at from e naught over kt and 0. So once you do that, you get k times 1 half e naught over kt squared, and that's the answer. It's pretty simple. Substituting the 1 over 2.404, 1 for k, and then dividing that by 2, and you get 0 0.21 which is the answer in the textbook. So that's where that answer comes from in that textbook. And it's kind of fun to play around with it. Let's pretend like 10 centimeters is our wavelength, and you then get about 240,000 UHF photons per cubic meter, which is pretty cool. And those can only be picked up on old televisions. And the old televisions that would have picked those things up, the broadcasters have, were forced by the uh, Federal Communications Commission to go offline. So we no longer in the United States broadcast in UHF and VHF. That's just, those are gone. Well, let's go on to the next one. We're going to do roughly the same thing that we did last time, except our approximation is going to be different. For the exp of x on the bottom, now we're doing the, the short wavelength regime or the high energy regime. For this case, e naught over kt is going to be large. So when this is large, the x for all x, then the exponential of x compared to 1 will be large. So we can actually just approximate exp of x minus 1 with simply the exponential. That's going to make our calculation a lot easier. However, easy is a, for some people, going to be a matter of taste. So what we have to do in order to do this integral is that we have to do integration by parts, and we have to do it three times. So to review what integration by parts is, you can see this little formula for it, which is the integral of some expression. We're going to have two functions, both functions of x. So we have u as a function of x and v as a function of x. And these are just kind of uh, filler functions. These are variables for functions. And so if we have an integral of u times dv, which dv is a function of x, so it's dv, really dv dx. So that's going to be equal to the, the full of that integral will be equal to the product of the u function times the v function minus the integral of the v times du. That general formula for the integration by parts is how you accomplish almost all these tasks where you have a particularly hairy formula. Now, integration by parts is an old calculus math trick, and it has a long history, but uh, it goes, I think it dates back to the 18th century uh, when it was discovered. But anyway, be that as it may, what we care about is what two functions can we use for u and v? 
and from our expression that we have, what we're going to use for u is x squared, and what we're going to use for v is e to the minus x, or minus e to the minus x specifically, which is kind of a weird way of looking at it, but it'll be helpful. So if we then say x squared times e to the minus x, we've kind of re, uh, reworked it just a little bit just to make it easier to read. The first part, which is the uv, uh, is going to be in that red box, which is minus x squared ex. So we've taken the product of our two functions. Now, how do we determine u and v? Kind of magic, <laughs> but we also kind of, we could play around with it. Integration by parts is a little bit of intuition and a little bit of playing around with it. It's also knowing that some things are easier to take derivatives of, and some things have easy things to get their integrals from. So if you have something particularly easy, then you can mix them together and do integration by parts. This is a little bit of intuition to get there because integration by parts, you have to kind of VG your way through it. Anyway, in the red box is where we put u times v, and that is minus x squared times e of x. That's the first of the integration by parts. The second part, which is the minus v du, is in the green box, and that's actually v times du, but du is 2x, all right? dx actually du is 2x dx. And so that's where we get that integration from. So v is going to be minus e to x, but then we have a minus of that, so it turns into a plus. That's our first integration by parts. We're actually going to do another integration by parts in the green box, which gives us the second uh, after equation. We still have the red box. We keep that the same. Now there's two parts to the new thing that are inside the green box. So I've made a little yellow box inside the green box <laughs> just to make things all even more entertaining. So we, have, we make a new pair of uv and vdus, right? That's what we're going to do there. And that gives us the next expression, which is minus 2x ex. And then the other integration by parts on that thing, where instead of, so now, in our second integration by parts, u is now simply x instead of x squared, but v is again e minus e to the minus e to the minus x. And so then we get what's in the yellow box, which is then again a plus 2 e to the minus x. Now we don't have to do integration by parts on that last one. It's immediately integrable, and we get minus 2 e to the x. So we have this expression minus x squared e to the x minus 2x e to the x minus 2 e to the x. Wow. That looks like we can factor out a bunch of stuff. We can factor out the e to the minus x, and we get this quadratic, which is minus x squared plus 2x plus 2. So we've got a quadratic in x times an exponential, which is the result of integrating that, that function. So I promise we're really almost done, because now we only care when x is large, meaning the frequency is much larger than, than some limiting frequent uh, energy, e sub naught, which is larger than kt. When x is large, the quadratic expression can be simplified to just x squared. So there's a lot of work to go through just to completely eliminate all that. And in fact, we could have seen that from the first integration by parts that we're looking at the red box that's still in there. That's an x squared times e to the minus x. And then we're integrating x times all these little bitty tiny pieces of x. And of course, there's the exponential. But x squared, x times it itself, will always be bigger than x times a tiny piece of itself. So the green box was going to always be smaller no matter what. So we really didn't have to go through that whole exercise of integration by parts. We could have approximated, and many physicists do that right off the bat, just to make your lives easier. But I wanted to show you the integration by parts just to kind of go through the, all the hairy detail. However, the net net of this thing is that actually, since x is large, we can approximate that quadratic x squared plus 2x plus 2 with simply x squared. And that's where the approximation comes. And we evaluate that from e naught over kt up through infinity. And what do we get? We get e naught over kt squared divided by the exponential e naught over kt. So let's go back to our original expression, which is the total number density of photons that have frequencies higher than some limiting energy, which is higher than kT, and that's compared to the total number density of all photons uh, across zero to infinity. So that's a fraction. We're looking at the fraction that are larger in energy than some threshold. All right, so we've got to plug this uh, original expression back in. We got k 
which is that constant I defined way back, times the thing we just evaluated, which is e naught squared e sub naught squared divided by kt over the exponential e naught over kt. Now k is of course 1 over 2.4041, and if we evaluate that we get 0 0.42. And there's the expression that we see in problem 2.45 2.5 in the textbook. And what's funny is, is that this, the, co the concept is, is that we're trying to see how many energy, high energy photons exist inside the cosmic microwave background proportionately. And so the high energy tail of the black body curve, there are some microwave photons that are like, I'm um, not microwave, I mean some infrared photons that are with wavelengths less than about a millimeter, but only 6% of the cosmic microwave backgrounds are in the infrared or shorter wavelengths. And if we then take infrared all the way up to optical, which begins at 9,000 angst, 9, angstroms or 900 nanometers, uh, that number drops because of that exponential really fast, that EXP kills it just incredibly fast, so much so that there's only about 10 to the minus 2,518th optical photons are in that cosmic microwave background. Now 10 to the minus 2518, wow, that's a lot more than the total number of photons in the universe. In fact, you'd have to get a lot of universes in order to get that many just to get one optical photon. So basically, there are exactly zero optical photons. And I made a remark before in the video about that there will be none in any of the cosmic quantum fluctuations that arose in the inflationary epoch, because that only gives you like 10 to the 60th or so additional known universes that were in contact with our universe at the time of inflation. So there are literally zero. Uh, cosmic microwave background photons in optical wavelengths or shorter. And that's how we have that. So that was a bit about two problems from the textbook from Barbara Ryan's Introduction to Cosmology. That's the second edition. This is chapter two, problems 2.5 and 2.6. So hope you enjoyed this and uh, I'll try to boost another few things like this as we go along for other member-only videos here on the channel. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.